We're going to continue on in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 5 is where we will be this morning. Uh, We will be hitting the the various chapters that I think are most representative and will most help you understand uh, the book of Isaiah. And we're in Isaiah 5 this morning. He will continue on in giving analogies and proclaiming woes over the people of Israel. He uses many different analogies through his teachings to help the people understand what God is doing in their midst. And this morning, the analogy will be of a vineyard, uh, a vineyard gone wild. If you've, there's a lot of beautiful vineyards around in Virginia, and if you've been to one of those vineyards and you've driven up and seen that, that they're very meticulous, everything is in just right rows, and all the vines are tied up in a very particular way, and everything's weeded exactly right. You don't just go around a vineyard with a weed whacker just going crazy. You'll kill all the vines. And so everything is very meticulous and in order. But we'll see this morning that this vineyard of Israel, of Judah, I should say, is gone wild and it is out of order. And Isaiah will proclaim woes over the people when a prophet or the Lord Jesus, because the Lord Jesus did this same thing, woe unto you. When someone is, a, a woe is proclaimed over them, it's a warning, it's a condemnation, it's something of sadness. And at the end, he proclaims judgment over them. If they will not turn their ways, if they will not change the way that they are living, they cannot go on like that forever. There will be judgment. And so I'd ask you to stand this morning to honor the Lord as we read his word. We'll read uh, portions of chapter 5. I'll begin in verse 1. Let me sing for my beloved, my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. Verse 3. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it it to yield grapes, it yielded wild grapes. And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its walls, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns will grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. He looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed, for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. Verse 18, woe to those who draw iniquity, draw iniquity with cords of falsehood, who draw sin as with cart ropes, who say, let him be quick, let him speed his work that we may see it. Let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw near and let it come that we may know it. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and shrewd in their own sight. Woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine and valiant men at mixing strong drink, who acquire the guilty for a bribe and deprive the innocent of his right. Therefore, as the tongue of fire devours the stubble, as dry grass sinks down in the flame, so their root will be as rottenness and their blossom go up like dust. For they have rejected the law of the Lord of hosts. They have despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against his people and he stretched out his hand against them and struck them. And the mountains quaked and their corpses were as refuse in the midst of the streets. For all his anger has not turned away, and his hand is outstretched still. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Please be seated. Well, in verses 1 through 7, the nation of Judah is spoken of as a vineyard, a vineyard that is loved of the Lord, and the people were a chosen people, a people chosen of the Lord and brought into the place that they were by the hand of God. They were placed in the good place of Israel by the will and by the work of the Lord himself. He cleared and planted and made space for this nation where they were. It was as if a person had 
built a vineyard and then put a watchtower there waiting for something to happen, dug a, a vat, a wine vat. Why would you dig a wine vat? Because you're expecting good wine to come from this land. You're expecting fruit to come from what you have planted, but nothing came. There was an expectation of a harvest, and yet what was actually yielded was wild grapes or a brambly mess that was un, unfit to be used for anything. All that God had done for this people and all that he had invested in them, it was all wasted. In verse 4, the prophet says this, What more was there to do for my vineyard that I had not done in it? What else could God have done for Israel? If we go back and read in the Old Testament about the history of Israel, everything was done for them. They were brought out of slavery. They were, there was a way made for them. Their enemies were driven out. They were brought into a good land. The nation strengthened and strengthened until the temple was built. We get to the time of Solomon, and there's great wealth, and there's great prosperity. I mean, absolutely everything is going great for this people. And then they just go right off the cliff as they reject the Lord. The fruit that should have been born was not born. All that God did for the people of Israel to bring them into a promised land and bless them as a people, the fruit that came back to the Lord for this was hard-hearted ungodliness, idolatry, pride, and abuse of the poor. All of it together was a mess, and Isaiah is condemning the people for their situation. Verse 5 Speaking for the Lord, he says, And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. What is the Lord going to do now that he looks at the people and what is happening there? He says two things. I'm going to remove my hand of protection and I'm going to remove my active hand of care. He says, I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. The idea that the Lord God is protecting his people this is always a part of Christian people's lives. It's something that we're supposed to pray for regularly. It's part of the Lord's prayer. Uh, deliver us from evil. Protect us from temptation. We're asking for God to put a hedge around us, if you will. Something to protect us from all the evil that's in this world. We should be constantly praying for God to protect us from evil things in this world. In their hard-heartedness, God is going to remove his protection from them and all this flood of wickedness come in. But he's also going to remove his active hand of care and grace of doing things for them because God is not passive. But he says he's going to stop the rain. He's going to stop pruning and hoeing, which is cultivating the nation. He's going to stop doing all of this and give them over to their sins. But verse 7 is really important, something that we should see, that he looks down. It says he looked for justice. But behold, bloodshed for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. We can't miss that God is looking. God was looking upon the nation of Israel. He is not blind. His eyes see and his ears hear, and the Lord is aware of what is happening in the world. And he was aware of the waywardness and the hard-heartedness of Judah at this time. And he wanted to see justice in the land. He wanted to see righteousness. But when he looks down upon that people, what he sees is violence and all the things that we talked about last week. The whole nation in a state of chaos. And so Isaiah begins to pronounce woes upon the people. Woes of warning. He starts in verse 18 where we start today. Woe to those who draw iniquity with cords of falsehood. Who draw sin as with cart ropes. A cart rope is a big old rope. That's a rope that you're going to put around a horse that you're going to draw a loaded cart with, something that's probably too big for a person to even move at all. And when I think about a person bound up with a cart rope hauling a giant load, my mind goes straight to Hebrews chapter 12, where in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, the author says this, "'Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely.'" so that we might pursue, that we might run the race in seeking after Christ. And it's the idea of a person running a race and there's something entangling their feet and they've got to get rid of this entanglement so they can run or cast off this weight so that they're freer to run the race that the Lord Jesus has put before them. But how could you possibly live for the Lord and run this race, as it were, if you have a giant cart rope tied around you with a huge burden of sin that you're pulling behind you? 
It makes me think about the old movie that we love in our household, uh, The uh, Christmas Carol, and old Marley. Marley comes in with these giant chains all around him and says, Ten Christmases ago, your chains were this big. And it's this idea of a person being deeply weighed down with sin. This is the same general idea. A person that is so weighed down with the weight of their sin that they can't even move. They can't even tow it. They're just stuck under the weight of sin that is bound to them. I believe there are people here this morning that are in that way. You come in this morning with a weight of sin and guilt on your life that is incapacitating. You feel hopeless about the life that is before you. You don't know how you can make any progress in life with the sin that is so encumbering you and you don't know what to do with it. And this morning, I want you to hear the same message that Isaiah is proclaiming to the people of Israel, that you can be free of these sins if you will but confess them and forsake them. The Lord Jesus is merciful and he is gracious, and he will deliver you from the guilt and sins of your life. Verse 19 is another woe. Woe to those who say, let him be quick, let him speak his work. Let we may see it. Let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw near that we may know it. This is the idea of a sign being given. Let God do something. Like we're looking for something. If God will just do something, we'll believe in him. So let him, let him be quick about his work. But you look back at the nation of Israel and you say, what could possibly have been done for the people of Israel that wasn't done and meticulously recorded about the works of the Lord in the midst of a people? There's not anything possibly that could be done more for them that would convince them. And it makes me think in the New Testament of Jesus nailed to the cross and the mockers, because that's what this is. This is a mocker. The mockers that came to Jesus and said, you claim to be the son of God. Just come on. If you come on down off that cross, we will believe in you. You said you were the son of God. Why don't you do something? If you show us a sign, we'll believe. After the entire ministry of Jesus which had been shown every sign, every, every healing, every wonder that anyone could possibly need to see. But miracles don't cause faith. And so these people had not come to salvation and still they mock Jesus and spit on him. What blessing could, not, could be given to Israel that was not already given to it? Which is expressly stated in verse 4. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I had not done in it? Nothing is the answer. The Lord had done everything that could or should or needed to be done to bring these people to repentance, but their hearts were hard and they hated the Lord and they hated his prophet Isaiah. And so Isaiah gets to verse 20, which is going to be the central focus of our time together here this morning. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet, sweet for bitter. This is a reversing of things that have objective categories. This is ultimately pointing to the reversal of a moral order. That is what Isaiah is aiming at. Because these things are not blank canvases open to personal definition. When you look at bitterness and sweetness, there is an objective definition to what is bitter and what is sweet. And everyone here knows the difference between the two. There is an objective difference between what is light and what is darkness. And everyone knows the difference between those two. But the point that Isaiah is making is that there is also an objective difference between what is good and what is evil. And we ought to know the difference between those two. Just like the categories of bitterness and sweetness, light and darkness are not open for redefinition. The categories of what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is evil are also not open for redefinition. They are defined by God. What is good and what is evil is not fluid. What is good and what is evil is not subjective related to culture. It is not able to be redefined by a person's self-expression. Good is grounded in and flows from the character of God Almighty. Let me say that again. What is good is grounded in and flows from the character of God Almighty. So when we say that God is good, when I say God is good, most people here 
God does good when I say that God is good. Because what they think is that there is a higher standard. There's some standard up here that is the standard of goodness. And then God acts according to that standard. But that is not at all what the Bible is saying. And that is not what I'm saying this morning. There is no higher standard. God is the standard. God is goodness. And when God acts, his actions are good. And he is the one that teaches us what is right and what is wrong. Because those actions that we see as God reveals himself to us is in fact imparting to us what is good. God is good. His character is the origin and the fountain of all goodness. We learn goodness from God. We imitate God. We are imitating what is good. When we rebel against God, we are rebelling against what is good and we are acting evil. God's character is goodness. And so the fixed nature of moral goodness related to the fixed nature of God is often called a moral compass. And we'll say that a person that has lost their way has lost their moral compass. They have lost direction, moral direction in their life. And I think this is a good analogy, but I want to help you understand this by giving a little bit more uh, meat to this and and helping you understand this direction. So some years ago, I I got my captain's license, uh, U.S. Coast Guard captain's license, down at uh, Key West, uh, the Naval Air Station down there. And it's an interesting place to learn how to navigate a boat because a, a, ca- a captain's license is not related to driving a boat around in the open ocean. Anybody can go out in the open ocean and drive a boat around. Like, there's nothing to hit out there. You're not going to run around. It's easy. The whole course is related to navigation because the key to being able to pilot a boat is where is this boat going and not getting lost at sea and being able to navigate the channel and get into safe harbor. And so as we go through this course, it's all about route planning and chart reading and terrain navigation and course direction by use of compass, because certainly there's lots of electronics on boats now, but the, the whole idea is that electronics can fail, lightning can strike, your batteries can go dead, and you have to still be able to get in. So the whole course is related to compass and chart. And when you are out in the open ocean, and I don't know how many of you have actually been out in the open ocean, but... You're just going to have to trust me if you've never been there. Once you get past the horizon and there is no land, in every direction you look, there is nothing but water everywhere. It is completely disorienting. You have absolutely no idea where you are. You have, you, there's, there's no way to orient a big blue sky and a bunch of endless water, and the wind's blowing one way and the tide's going the other way, and you have no idea how to, how to navigate. And so what you have to do is you have to take out your chart and you have to take out your compass. And the compass is what orients the chart. So you orient the chart according to the compass, and then the two of them together tell you, I need to go this way to get to land, because I know that land is due northwest of where I am or wherever you may be. And so once you plot the course on your compass, you steer the boat in that direction. And Every seaworthy boat, if it has got nothing else on it other than an engine, it's going to have a compass mounted on the dash, because you cannot... Uh, motor a boat without a compass and so you set your compass heading and you start steering in that direction and the weird thing about it is that the wind is blowing like this and the tide is pulling you like this and as the tide and the, the currents are pulling you the smaller boat especially you know you, your wheel is at an angle and everything about your senses is telling you that you're steering in a circle I mean everything you're like I, I, I've got to be going in a circle there's no way I'm not going in a circle But the compass says you're going exactly where you need to go. And the key to navigation is following the compass. And eventually the land will come over the horizon and the landmark that you were looking for is seen. You're like, well, my goodness, I actually was going in a straight line. And even when you can see the land where you're going, it still often feels like you are driving in a circle if you weren't looking at the the point which you were aiming at. And so the culmination exercise to get your your captain's license is to go out in the dark in the middle of the night and uh, navigate yourself into safe harbor. And so not only can you get lost at sea, but you've got to navigate in through the channel because most of the water around Key West is about this deep. And if you run your boat up on the ground, you're going to wreck your boat because water is very powerful. It'll destroy your boat. And there's all kinds of wrecked ships out there from people that didn't know how to do this, whose boats are still there to tell about it. And you've got to 
find the harbor, find the channel, and that's using the charts and their channel markers. Red, right, returning from the sea, green on the left, they're each numbered, they each have certain blinking periodicity, and the chart tells you which blinking period is each thing, and you line these things up, and you figure it out, and you find your way in. And it's not like you look at the chart and the compass one time out there, and you just drive in. You are up and down and up and down, like, oh, is that the right one? That's the right one. There it is. It's right there. No, it's not here. And you're back and forth and all over the place continuing to check your references because you can't change what is there. And so the whole point in sharing this example with you and the idea of a moral compass is that there are set standards to reality. The cardinal directions of a compass, north, south, east, and west, do not change. The depth of the water does not change. The channel marking signals do not change. And if you decide to ignore all of this and just drive your boat wherever you want to, you're either going to end up lost at sea, of which people used to die until somebody in a helicopter comes out and finds you, or you're going to run your boat aground and destroy your boat. And then you're going to have to explain why you destroyed your boat. But you can't just do whatever you want to do. You have to follow the directions of a compass and a chart. People that are in rebellion against God think that they can reverse the moral order without consequence, and they are wrong. The moral order of what is good and evil is set and determined by the character of God. And if you have lost your way morally and decide that you're going to do whatever you want to do, you will run aground or you will be lost at sea. You must have a direction, and the direction for these things comes from the Lord. Today, there is most commonly expressed a difference between the two camps of people, between what is called virtue and what is called values. Virtues are things that are defined by the scriptures and have been passed down for many thousands of years. There are classic virtues, and each of these has a positive definition, which means a definition that teaches us a clear direction by which we must go. The seven classic Christian virtues that come to us from Scripture and ultimately from the character of God are charity or or love, patience, temperance, which means moderation, chastity, humility, thankfulness, diligence. A virtuous person lives a life like this, and these are characteristics that come from God, and they teach us how to live a virtuous life. But very seldom in our day and age do you hear a person described as a virtuous person. Instead, what we hear so often is a person that shares our values. Well, values and virtues are not the same thing. Virtues are rooted in the character of God. Values are just something that a group of people consider valuable, and it can be anything. As we get into political season, which it seems like is every season these days, The politician will always say, this candidate shares our values. That statement means nothing because your values can be anything. People value all kinds of things. And what we have here in the book of Isaiah is that the people had rejected God. And we see that in our time as well. People that radically reject God. I do not want to go the way that God wants me to go. But when you say, I'm not going the way God wants me to go, it leaves a void in your heart, a directionless person. And people can't live that way. People know they have to have some moral order. They have to go in some direction. And so people then begin to set their own values. They begin to set their own direction. And they go the direction that they want to go. And this has been expressed by many different people in many different ages But for our age, uh, one of the first major uh, developers of this thinking that has, as they spoke about it 100 years ago, we are now living in the teeth of it now. Jean-Paul Sartre, a famous French existential philosopher and playwright in the 20th century, was very clear that people cannot live without morality. And he was right. But he wrote, man must choose his own values. And that's exactly what they've done. They've rejected God, and they've chosen their own values. He wrote that we should choose who we want to be. If your values are the opposite of God's virtues, then so be it. If you want to call good evil and evil good, then go do it. You are choosing the value that what is valuable to you, and you are going and doing it. Around that same time, 
going from a personal level to a community level, a woman named Ruth Benedict wrote a very influential book called The Patterns of Culture. And in this book, she argued that all ways of life and all patterns of culture are equally valid. What that has become known as is cultural relativism. And what she specifically wrote was that the culture and mores of a society can make anything right or anything wrong. And she went through and surveyed many different cultures, all the way down to those of cannibals, not condemning them for the way that they live, because that's how they have chosen to live. And their culture has validated that for them as a value that they feel is important. And what happens when we go down this way of having absolutely no objective right and no objective wrong, there is no set morality. And people are going every which way. And the sense of meaninglessness begins to set in on people, that there is no meaning, there is no direction to my life. And so what people do, and they do it every day now, and it is in a more radical way than it has ever been in my lifetime, is that people begin to try to create meaning in their life by deciding their own moral code. And through their own self-expression, they go out and declare what is evil and what is good from their own personal choices. But what happens is they get out there and they make these choices, and many people are at least honest with themselves, saying, you know what, I chose this to be right and wrong, but I can't tell you that this is right and wrong because I just chose this and made this up myself. And then before long, we're surrounded by a tolerance culture because no one has any ground to tell anybody what is right and wrong because everyone is just making this up as they go along. And it becomes impossible. In the, in the nation of Israel and in America today, we have a great deep moral breakdown as people reverse good and evil and light and darkness. People going out, having their own personal expressions and their own values being their standard for what is right and wrong. The last sentence in the book of Judges summarizes this pretty well, where it says, each person did what was right in their own eyes, and it was total chaos. It's impossible to govern a people when no one can agree on a moral standard. When there is no moral standard, you can't enforce a moral standard. It's impossible to parent when there is no moral standard because you cannot instruct your child or discipline your child. And that's where we are now, where so much of parenting is simply encouraging a child to express themselves. And in that personal self-expression, they will find their way. Well, the Bible tells us that children are sinners. I love all my children, but they're all sinners. And if you tell a little sinner to just go express himself, good things are not going to happen. And when that person turns into a teenager, we shouldn't be surprised when that person is off the rails. And when they're a later teenager, when they end up in a place of utter despair, because they know that there's no meaning in what they have created, and it's all a falsehood, and it's a fairy tale, and no one will tell them what the ground of truth is. And so when we go back to virtues versus values, the virtues of godliness have been transformed into the values of an ungodly world. The virtue of charity has changed to selfishness, the virtue of patience to immediate gratification, the virtue of temperance and moderation to indulgence, chastity to bold perversion, humility to pride, thankfulness to entitlement, diligence to entertainment. And this is where we are. And this is where Israel was. And Isaiah came speaking to them about these things, calling them back. And I am calling you back. But how do we ever get out of this mess? How do we, how do we reverse course and get a true charted course that will take us to safe harbor? Well, it is to hear the word of the Lord as it always has been. When we go to the Gospel of Luke, we shouldn't think that the people of Jesus' time were much different. This has always been the struggle of the world. And this is why when we hear this, let's, let's read from Luke chapter 4, verses 31 and 32. This is about Jesus. And he, Jesus, went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. That's powerful. 
They were surrounded by lots of tradition, lots of people in big robes, Roman government, all kinds of things, and there was mass moral confusion. But when Jesus came and spoke, his words carried authority because they were the words of God. And people knew it, and it struck their heart. And they either wanted to follow after Jesus and live for him, or they hated him and they wanted to kill him. It was radically polarizing. And so today, when we speak, the word of God and the truth of God does not have its authority based on statistics or judges or councils or tradition. God's word carries its own authority. And when it strikes your heart and you know you've heard something from the Lord, it is important that you hear that and that you react to it. For the word of the Lord is our moral compass. And when we go to the word of the Lord and we are so confused and we're lost and we're wandering and we're afraid we're getting ready to run aground, that's when we have to go and check our bearings according to the scriptures as the direction that we ought to go. And many times we will feel like we're going in a circle, but you see, God, God's word is telling me to go this direction. God, help me. I'm going to keep going this direction. And eventually you will see land, brothers and sisters, and you will see that the direction you have been going was a good and right direction, though it was by faith for a long time. In the past here with Isaiah, rebellion against God resulted in great moral relativism back then. And Isaiah proclaims judgment on them if they don't believe, if they don't change, if they don't turn away from this. And it's the exact same message today. This is why this is recorded for us, is the nature of human beings doesn't change and the nature of God doesn't change. And we need to hear this message as much today as the people of Judah needed to hear it back then. And so we are warned by Isaiah. And I want to read a a brief statement by Andrew Davis, pastor of First Baptist Durham, just a wonderful man and a friend. Isaiah 5 speaks a word of warning to the American evangelical church. For no church in history has had as many spiritual advantages as Christians in America. Bibles in a variety of translations, good seminaries teaching the truths of the word of God, publishers, book distributors, internet resources, good preaching and digital downloads and streaming, godly role models, men and women openly living for Christ, opportunities to serve the Lord in short and long-term missions, good Bible-believing churches, and yet... For all the avalanche of God's grace, it is amazing to many observers how little fruit is being produced here. We must be warned not to receive these graces from God in vain, but live to display his holiness in an increasingly corrupt age and to spread the name of Jesus from shore to shore. For everyone whom has been given much, much will be required. That's a powerful statement, brothers and sisters. And it speaks to us in general, but as I close, I want to speak to you in particular. I don't know what's going on in your heart this morning. I want to speak first to those of you that have come into this place and know that you are living in rebellion against God. You know that you're calling good evil and evil good. And you've been going in your own way and you've been trying to define your own reality. I'm calling you to follow after Jesus. Jesus is good and he is merciful And he will cut the ropes of sin that binds you so tightly. And he will give you life that you never knew that you could have. If you will but follow him and believe in him. But if you carry on in your sins, it will destroy you. Your life will be shipwreck. And it will come to no good end. So let us hear the warnings of Isaiah. And let us know the mercy of Christ that you too might be saved. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for this time. Thank you for this chance to be together as a church. Thank you for this warning, this such clear language. And I pray help us, Lord. May we not be dissuaded from following after your word. May it be our compass and our true guide. And I pray, Lord, as we go into the confusion of this world, that we will not lean on statistics or judges or politicians, Lord, but we will lean only on your word. And that we will follow after the voice of the Lord, for the sheep of the Lord hear his voice and they follow him. Let us hear your voice, O Lord, and follow your ways that we might make it, Lord, to glory one day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.